What are you trying to say? I don't know. Because of all the deaths? Don't do that. Where are you at, kind of? Don't with my hair. Look at my hair. Maybe I was blind, on you forever while I tried to find Someone that could be my great love Right in front of me, I didn't realize you were my dream So you took me by surprise, oh yeah Welcome back to my channel. For those of you who are new, welcome to you as well. My name is Jennifer. And this is Jean. And today we're going to start a new series on my channel. We're aiming to do this once a week on Mondays because we're going to name it Mystery aiming. Monday. Yes, we're going to aiming. try. But at least twice a month, if not every Monday. That sounds so, about right. Yeah. Every other week, we can handle it. It's a feasible goal. It's a feasible it's still, aim. Uh, it's still a work in progress depending on how much you guys like it as well back at halloween time i did mysteries during the month of october and a lot of people seem to like those so this is always this is something that gets our attention that we like we like murder mysteries and i love this pro podcast i listen to it all the time it's called two ladies Um, Murder mystery. Vanished. No. Disappeared. That's vanished is one of them, but this is my favorite murder. <laughs> Little brain fog there. Um, so I listen to this podcast uh, every week, and it's called My Favorite Murder. It's about mysteries, not necessarily just murders, but just unexplained deaths. Um, all these kinds of different things. I'm a big podcast person. There's also another podcast I listen to called The Vanished, and it um, tells stories about people who have disappeared, unexplained disappearances, murders, all those kinds of things. So this is something that we have, we both have in common that we are interested in. So we decided that we would take a different kind of mystery on Mondays and share it with you guys. You can also kind of call it creepy pasta. Yeah. Definitely. And so this week we are going to do the case of Elisa Lamb. Who was found dead at the Cecil Hotel in 2013, of February 19th. Uh, she was found in a water tank, uh, her corpse rotting, I believe for a good, what, 10 plus days yeah, or so? Because people uh, tasted the water, they were bathing with this water, they were brushing their teeth, they were drinking this water, and um, and so the water pressure was low, as well as it yeah. was an increasing funny and bad odor and taste. Really disgusting. So they complained and called on that. The maintenance went to go check on the water towers at this hotel, and that's where they found her body. Right. She had already been reported missing before that. She had yes. been missing a couple weeks before that. And then it was during these complaints when the maintenance was checking that they found her deceased in this water tank. And at the time of her death, she had decided that she was going to take a trip during her hiatus from college and she was going to tour cities in California that she was interested in. And just a little back history on Alyssa, Elisa. Elisa has a history of mental illness, of bipolar disorder, as well as depression. She was prescribed four medications for her depression and bipolar, which was Wellbutrin, Effexor, Lamisil, and Seroquel. And even though her family kept her mental illness a secret, there were no reports of Elisa being suicidal or having any kind of outbursts or strange behaviors that would cause anyone to believe that she had a mental illness history because 
nobody ever She was knew quiet it. to herself, a little eccentric and artistic, and her blog is actually still up. I don't know what it's called. It's probably, you can look up Elisa Lamb blog. Right. It's still live today. But in the, in the months prior to her disappearance, she talked about relapse and of, about having to drop several classes, but she never really, ex, you know, talked about what the relapse was from. She just casually said she had a relapse and that's why she was dropping several of her classes. Elisa's family was worried about her traveling alone, but Elisa agreed to check in with her parents daily, which eased their concerns. What which little is, they knew is that they should have been very concerned. Right. And, I mean, it is concerning to having a young person set out. She'd never really traveled anywhere far from home. And she, that was the first time, of course, with her history of mental illness. Her parents were concerned about her traveling alone and to a place where she's never been before. So, checking in daily was something that they felt more at ease with her doing and letting her have her freedom as an adult, but still being able to be in contact with them. So Elisa first visited San Diego, where she toured the San Diego Zoo and other popular attractions before leaving the city and arriving in Los Angeles on January the 24th. And she checked into the Hotel Cecil on January the 26th. And this is where things get interesting. So before we tell you any more about Elisa, and her disappearance and death, we're gonna tell you a little bit about the hotel where she checked into and eventually disappeared from and was eventually found dead at. So the Hotel Cecil was built in 1924 at a cost of $1 million. It was a very exquisite hotel. It had stained glass windows and large marble statues in the lobby. It, had, it was a 600 bedroom hotel. It was designed for out of town travelers. It was supposed to be this really exquisite destination location for wealthy, well-to-do people. Of course, in 1924, a cost of $1 million to build a hotel was like probably about 10 million now. Yeah, and back then, yeah, it was very high priced. So the doors opened in 1927 and it flourished for a while, but soon after that, the Great Depression hit. And even though it continued to do fairly well through the 1930s, by the time the 1940s hit, that's when things started going downhill for the hotel. So at that time in the 1940s, there were less out of town visitors and it became more of a place and a refuge for long-term residents. They started renting the rooms out to weekly or monthly people that turned their hotel into a residence. And the area around the hotel was becoming less and less desirable for travel. It was becoming a place known for transients, for homeless people. The four mile radius within the hotel had nearly 10,000 10, homeless. homeless people. So, so there was a lot of drugs and prostitution and, and the such around the area. Right, and the hotel became known as a place to go to do drugs for couples that were having affairs, for prostitution, and that type of criminal activity. Then by the 1950s, that's when it became very, very bad. And then that's when the hotel... It was known as, as Skid Row. Right, that area. right. As the area around the Cecil uh, continued to uh, decline, then suicides, violent crimes, and murders began to rise in the area. The first documented case of a suicide at the Hotel Cecil was in 1931 when the guest of W.K. Norton died in his room after taking poison capsules. And after that, the suicides pretty much took place once a year at least, or once every other year. By the 1960s, long-term residents at the Cecil started referring to the hotel as the suicide because so many suicides were taking place. There were 16 documented cases of suicide. 14 of those cases were of people actually jumping to their death out of various floors of the windows. And then that doesn't even include the violent murders that took place there. The case of Richard Ramirez, the Night Stalker, he stayed at the hotel and it was rumored that a couple of his victims were actually killed in the Hotel Cecil. And that was 1984 and 85 when he stayed there. Yes. And then 
a while later in the 90s, there was a copycat serial killer who stayed there because he wanted to be like Richard Ramirez and he stayed there and it said that he actually killed some people in that hotel as well. So with all the suicides and just deaths in general and all the violence that took place around the hotel, people started thinking that the supernatural and evil spirits was what was causing people to kill themselves. They were being taunted and tormented and they were actually jumping out the windows to escape the torment of the supernatural, the evil spirits. Something bad That was there. trapped inside that hotel. And I mean, I believe, it depends on what you believe, but with all the suicides that took place there and all the violence, I believe that it couldn't help there be negative energy and negative spirits that are still trapped. Not necessarily just negative, but spirits and people that are lost and are trapped inside that hotel still to this day. I if believe. you have depression issues, do not stay at the Cecil Hotel. Exactly. The Cecil Hotel has been popular over the years. A lot of people have probably heard of it. There have been paranormal um, investigators that have stayed there and have reported seeing ghosts and orbs and just creepy, eerie things that have happened. The popular TV series American Horror Story actually dedicated a season to the Cecil Hotel and it was called Hotel and it was inspired by the events that took place in the hotel. So now that we've told you a little bit about the background of the hotel, we can go ahead and tell you more about Elisa and her disappearance, her mysterious disappearance and death. So as we told you earlier, Elisa checked into the Hotel Cecil on January 26th. She was booked to stay in a hotel room that was shared with a couple other people. And it was only a couple days that she stayed in that particular hotel room because the occupants of that other her shared room roommates yeah her roommates were reporting that she was acting a little strange and they were uncomfortable staying with her in the room probably a little bipolarish or yes. maybe influenced by some kind of creepy spirit that floats around there we don't know exactly so they moved her to a room on her own where she was alone. So everything seemed pretty much okay after they moved Elisa and she got her own room. She did things around the city. A retail clerk at the bookstore that was near the hotel gave information about her buying some souvenirs for her family. She said she had a conversation with her because she was worried about what would fit in her bags, what she had room to take home with her, and everything seemed pretty much okay, and there was nothing out of the ordinary. No one reported any other kind of strange behavior for her. So on the 31st, Elisa did not check in with her parents. Her parents started getting worried, and so they contacted the LAPD. So after speaking with the hotel management and businesses in the area, staff did acknowledge seeing her. Uh, alone that day and just like Jennifer said a bookstore manager remembered seeing Elisa that day uh, as well as when she entered the store and purchased souvenirs to take home to her family okay. police police did search the hotel to the extent uh, that they were able but what does that mean that they were able but well, did not search because her room? they didn't have a search warrant so they can't just barge into all the rooms Okay. So they just searched the areas that they were able to. Because at the time, continue reading, uh, there was no probable cause of a crime taking place. It right. wasn't until a week later, on, January, on February the 6th, that the LAPD decided they needed more help. They made flyers, posted them around the community, and the story found its way to the internet where it quickly gained attention. On February 15th, after another week of no leads, the LAPD released a video of Elisa the day she went missing on an elevator. Now, this is very strange. We're going to include a link to where you can watch this video. We'll include right here a little bit of snippet of the video. Now, there are a lot of conspiracy theories involving her death and disappearance. And one of those is a Korean elevator game. And she is seen getting on this elevator and she is acting very strange. The elevator is acting very strange. 
If anybody has, I'm sure everybody has ridden an elevator and uh, people who we ride the elevator multiple times a day. So you know when you get on the elevator, as long as you are not blocking the door, the elevator doors immediately close within a few seconds of being on the elevator. But when Elisa got on the elevator, the doors stayed open and they didn't close. Even though she stood back, she got on the elevator, as you'll see in this video, she pressed all these different buttons she stood back and she kind of looked like she was hiding in the corner from something. And even though she was standing back, there was nothing blocking the doors of the elevator. The elevator doors didn't close. Yeah, and she also stood outside the elevator and it still did not close right. for quite some time. So these doors just somehow stayed open. Right. Really and weird. And then they did close once she went on down the hall a couple of minutes later. Right. And she Strange. got off a couple, like you said, she got off a couple times and she like peeked around the corner yeah. and she made kind of strange hand gestures and it kind of either looked like she was talking to herself or someone else, which brought it brings in the conspiracy theory of this Korean elevator game. Now the Korean elevator game is supposedly a game that obviously it originated in Korea and is was very popular in the dark places of the web and it takes place that you need to be in a building with at least 10 floors and you get on the elevator alone and you push a sequence of different buttons you go to different floors and if you do it correctly you're supposed to stop at the fifth floor of whatever building you're in and the elevator doors are supposed to open and a paranormal you're supposed to be a woman woman that is not really human gets on this elevator and you're not supposed to look at her you're not supposed to speak to her don't engage because if you do she will take you to another realm and you will not be able to escape and I don't know what happens some but. people have claimed that this other world is a little darker it's much like this world but it's a it's a other world and some things maybe out of place you might smell different smells mm -hmm. and suppose, supposedly see a woman on the fifth floor and sometimes it's, this... it kind of starts out like this you start at the first floor you go to the fourth floor then you go down to the second floor and you go to the sixth floor then you go back down to the first floor then you go to the tenth floor and then after that you go down to the fifth floor and at, the, at that point you're supposed to have been in entered into this realm with this woman supposedly coming in and, and sometimes I don't know why you know I, I guess it's kind of you know it's kind of like the game Bloody Mary and sometimes this woman you can be very tempted to speak to this woman because sometimes she could take the appearance of somebody you know Right. And that's why they urge you, if you're playing this game, which we will not be doing, um, that... And then your neighbor will probably come back and be like, why did, why did you, you just ignore speak? me? Exactly. And we did do a lot of research trying to find a video of something actually happening. We watched a lot of videos of people doing this experiment with this game, and we could never... We, we weren't able to find any... Well, I wouldn't say a lot of research, well, we but did... we did scratch the surface. Didn't right. really find anything, but who knows? There might be some... I mean, obviously, there's accounts of people... Yeah. Experiencing something. Right. So, so that is one of the conspiracy theories. I would not that... advise it. No, definitely not. I'm not going to be playing around with that Bloody Mary stuff anymore. I did that when I was a kid, and I actually did see some things. It was a whole other story, but. For another video. Yep. So that is one of the conspiracy theories that she got on this elevator, as you can see in this video, and she talked to this woman she got confused and then that's how she ended up trying to escape from this and she was confused and then that's how she ended up we're going to tell you how where she ended up i guess we should do that before we finish with the conspiracy theories so to backtrack before we tell you any more about the theories of how she disappeared and how she died on february the 19th during the search for her people that were staying in the hotel began complaining about low water pressure about the water being discolored and tasting odd so when the maintenance workers went to investigate these complaints outside of the hotel the water system that feeds into the hotel is four large water tanks and they will insert a picture of them they have ladders that lead up to them there is a heavy latch that you have to open to get into the tank. It's supposed to be locked. Yeah, it's supposed to be locked. Only the maintenance workers have a key to it. And it's just, it's very difficult to get into these. It's not like anybody could just pop into one accidentally or just a random person shouldn't be able to get into it on their own because 
of the ladder. So when the maintenance workers went to investigate these complaints, this is when they went into one of the tanks and they found Elisa's body. She was naked, her clothes were floating next to her, and her belongings were scattered around the water tank in the water. The only thing missing and has never been retrieved to this day is her cell phone. There's never been a ping to it or there's never been a trace of her cell phone. All of her other belongings were accounted for. On February 21st, the LA County Coroner released the autopsy report which listed it as an accidental death due to drowning. There was no evidence of physical trauma, sexual assault, or other violence or suicide. Toxicology tests were unable to be completed because there was not enough of her blood that was preserved, but the tests that were able to be completed showed traces consistent with the prescription medications that was found among her belongings that were prescribed to her for her bipolar disorder. And so, they did find a little bit of alcohol in her system. But just not any bit. more than just like a drink. Yeah, a beer, not, a yeah. drink, a glass of wine. There is also um, medications such as ibuprofen and a Sinutab type of medication that was also found in her bloodstream. But there was no recreational drugs or anything else unusual. All right, so this leads us to the theories of how she got into the water tank. And it's not like she was just sightseeing around the hotel. Um, the video of the elevator took place right before her disappearance. So she evidently got off the elevator and somehow ended up in that tank right after the elevator video. Now, the doors and stairs leading to the water tank have alarms. Only the staff have keys and the passcodes to open them. The doors are armed with alarms that would sound if someone attempted to enter those areas by force. It is possible to access them though through the fire escape steps, but it also poses more questions. Even if Elisa had used the fire escape, would it have been possible for her to get into the tank by herself? All of the water tanks are four by eight foot cylinders propped up on cement blocks that had to be accessed by ladders. Also, the lids would be difficult to replaced from inside she the lids were moved she would have to have moved the lid to get in and then once she was inside because the lids were all replay the lid was replaced so once she was inside she would have had to have slid the lid back and she was a very small petite girl and people were wondering if that's possible because of her she was so small would she have been able to move a cement cylinder it kind of sounds like that one of the staff is guilty since uh, there's alarms that should go off there's keys that sh you know somebody sh should have access to to unlock this latch uh, and so forth so that brings us to the theory that she was being chased by someone that maybe she ran from she was on the elevator maybe she was trying to get to another floor maybe the elevator jammed because she pressed so many buttons that she was trying to, when she was looking around, trying to make sure that there was no one coming. Then when she took off running, she just ran to the first place she could find, which was this water tank. And maybe she slipped and fell and hit her head. Well, there was no trauma, so she couldn't have hit her head. Um, but it, there's just all these questions that there's no answers for. And that's why people think that maybe it's paranormal. Maybe there was some kind of a spirit that was chasing her because she, of all these hauntings, of these suicides that took place in this hotel. 2015 was the last suicide that happened in the hotel. 2015. So that was even after her disappearance and death. So. Well, let's just face it. Uh, whether it's it was staff, physical, or it was a murder, or a suicide, I mean, this place is creepy. It yeah. has a consistent history of suicides and deaths in general so and even just watching that elevator video I got really bad vibes from it oh yeah it does have bad vibes if if you pick up on that kind of stuff it's got bad vibes and one of the last theories that is kind of out there and this is a little strange people are thinking that she could have been a victim of bioterrorism and that she was being controlled by the US government because after her death it was brought to the attention that there is a test for tuberculosis called the LAM-ELISA and that 
it was very close to her name. I mean, it was her name backwards. And how weird is it that this experiment was looking for people that the government wanted to inject with the tuberculosis virus to see how it acted on the brain and to be kind of like guinea pigs. Yeah, they called it the lamb Elisa test. Right. And people thought that maybe that she was a victim of bioterrorism and that it kind of like messed with her brain. She was injected with this, the government maybe, and it was a kind of like an oopsie kind of thing. And it just, she maybe lost her mind and did something. So we have possible suicide, possible murder, uh, paranormal. possible paranormal or possible conspiracy. Right. And there is just, there's no answers to this. No, it's just so the whole thing's strange. We've looked on, there was a Facebook group that involves the, her disappearance. People say they've stayed at the hotel. People say that it's definitely haunted. Um, there's just no answers to this. And it's very intriguing and it makes you want to keep digging for more answers, but there's just nothing out there because there's no clue. The rights to her story has been sold to Hollywood and it's going to be turned into a movie. Her parents are actually still alive. Her family is still alive. So this has been the strange and mysterious case of Elisa Lamb. We hope you guys enjoyed it. This is still very intriguing to us. And we still, we've been talking about doing this video and we've been talking about this for over a month now. And it's something we keep coming back to because it's just very, it's unexplained. It's intriguing. Yes. It's an unsolved mystery. Very much so. And in the future, if we find anything more or if there's any other details in the case, we'll definitely do a part two or an update to this video to let you guys know. And we hope you guys enjoyed hearing about this. Um, definitely, if you guys have anything to add, definitely leave a comment in the section below, in the comments below and we can have a discussion about it. And join us next time for our next Mysterious Monday, Mystery Monday, when we'll dive into another mystery. Remember, be the love, be the light, and do good things. Bye everyone.